Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is day three of uh, Invest Karnataka Global Investors Meet. Uh, on behalf of Government of Karnataka, this hearty welcome to all of you. As we are all aware, this is a very important session amongst the deliberations during the three days. And uh, welcome to the Australia Country Session and India Australia Partnering for Growth and Innovation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this session is being curated by the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce in collaboration with the Australian High Commission, New Delhi. At the outset, it's my pleasure to welcome on stage the moderator of the session, the Chief Executive Officer of the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Petula Thomas. Hearty welcome to you, Ms. Thomas. Kindly come over. Yeah, please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, in the interest of time, straight away over to you. Thanks so much for that kind introduction and introducing the session. Good morning, everyone. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Australia Country Session at the Global Investors Meet, India, Australia, Partnering for Growth and Innovation. As you've just heard, I'm Petula Thomas, CEO of the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce. And with thanks to the Australian government in India, Represented today by Hugh Boylan, Economic and Public Affairs Councillor, Australian High Commission, New Delhi. I'll be your moderator for this session. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the Honorable Minister, uh, Minister Ashwath Narayan, Minister for Higher Education, IT and Biotechnology and Science and Technology, and Ms. Gunjan Krishna, IAS, Commissioner for Industrial Development, Department of Industries and Commerce, one of the organizers of this uh, amazing summit, who are great friends of Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge Gavin Standen, Executive Partner Ecosystem Telstra, also our dynamic and visionary president of the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce, and the other four panelists who you'll hear from shortly. I'd like to mention Alexander Meekin, Senior Advisor, Australian Consulate General, Chennai, who is here from the Consulate, uh, from the Consul General, Ms. Sarah Curlew's team. A special thank you to many of our members who are present here, including those who have traveled from other parts of India to be here. Thank you so much. So the India-Australia partnership has taken a major leap, especially in the last one year. We've seen new layers of engagement, both governments committing to agreements across growth sectors, unlocking funds to boost cooperation, demonstrating consistency, and a future-focused approach that has intensified from mutual intent to robust action. And that's what we're seeing now. So in the next one hour, you'll hear an Australian government perspective on the bilateral relationship and the innovation synergies between our two countries. You'll then hear from five industry experts on what are some of the opportunities for both countries to connect in the innovation sphere and thereby significantly growing that two-way bilateral trade and investment and also providing solutions to the world. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions during the panel session, so please do make note of any questions that come to mind as we go along. And I promise we'll have that opportunity. So let's get started. To deliver the keynote address, I'd like to welcome the very knowledgeable and experienced Hugh Boylan, Economic and Public Affairs Councillor, Australian High Commission, New Delhi. Hugh has tremendous experience in negotiating bilateral free trade agreements for Australia, and like me, I'm sure you'll find his remarks extremely insightful. Good morning. Thank you, Pachula and the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce for organizing this event. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here at a time when India-Australia relations are at an historic high. The Australian government is deeply committed to the bilateral relationship. 
India is a vital partner for Australia in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. We're determined to take this partnership further across the board, from our regional cooperation in the Quad, to our economic and trade relationship, to our political relationship, and to our defence and security relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. This includes our important ongoing efforts to strengthen our economic engagement to our mutual prosperity. The Indian and Australian governments are working hard together in furtherance of that prosperity. Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal and his Australian counterpart, Trade and Tourism Minister Senator Don Farrell, spoke earlier this week. They have met in person twice since Minister Farrell became Trade Minister earlier this year. Ministers Farrell and Goyle have committed to quickly work towards the ratification of our landmark Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, or ECTA. ECTA will harness the complementary nature of our economies in agricultural produce, critical minerals, professional services, education, tourism, and much more. Critically, ECTA is also a stepping stone to achieving a full free trade agreement, our comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. I'm looking forward to an ambitious, high quality agreement that delivers for both our economies. Australia updated its India economic strategy earlier this year. The India economic strategy update is a call to action for government and business. It includes a five year plan for Australia to help achieve its long term economic ambitions with India. The new initiatives contained in the update cover the breadth of our shared priorities including agriculture, infrastructure, education and skills, public administration and governance, resources and energy, science and innovation, defence, cyber and critical technology. Today we're here to talk about innovation and growth. Given we're in Bengaluru, I'd like to focus on tech. How can Australia plug into India's impressive tech journey? And we know that so much progress in that journey has been made right here. Australia's International Cyber and Critical Technology Engagement Strategy sets out that our goal is technology that fosters sustainable economic growth and development. Australia is committed to a range of actions to achieve this goal, including maximising economic growth by shaping an enabling environment for digital trade. These goals are more important than ever now, over two years into the pandemic. We know that the pandemic has accelerated digital adoption in many regions of the world, including in the Indo-Pacific. There has been unprecedented demand for online services in retail, digital payments, education and health. The past two years have also, however, caused a widening of the digital divide as communities and businesses, particularly in developing economies, have become reliant on digital tools for their lives and livelihoods while operating in absence of sufficient access to advice, training or support. Women have been disproportionately affected with so many employed in informal economic sectors. The pandemic has exposed more users to cybersecurity and online safety risks in a disjointed global online environment where practices of cyber hygiene can be poor. A central question Indo-Pacific countries now face is how to drive accelerating digital transformation and ICT-enabled growth to reduce poverty and support sustainable economic growth, whilst at the same time maintaining resilience to cybersecurity threats. Global collaboration will be essential to achieving that goal. Both Australia and India are committed to a shared vision of a cyberspace and critical technologies that enable an Indo-Pacific that is open, safe, secure and prosperous. We can advance our shared vision and share our expertise to strengthen the foundations for an inclusive and thriving digital economy and provide greater diversity of sources of support for digital development in our region. India, as we know, has emerged as a global tech powerhouse. With 600 million internet users and a digital economy slated to reach a trillion US dollars by 2025. Hundreds of millions of new internet users will be coming online and India has the highest per capita mobile data consumption in the world. It has a massive startup ecosystem and swathes of tech talent, 
both of which are the envy of the world. India has important expertise to share given its role in global uh, health initiatives during the pandemic, like Cohen. India has the highest fintech adoption rate globally of 87%, which is significantly higher than the global average of 64%. At latest count, I think India has 107 unicorns, and these impressive startups will foster greater global partnerships. We know India has strong credentials as a leader in the global digital story, and we welcome the opportunity to work with India as it takes the helm of the G20 later this year. And we recognize the important opportunity the G20 provides to give additional profile to the important issue of the digital economy. The India-Australia relationship has gone from strength to strength in recent years. And as the global digital environment has accelerated and transformed, collaboration has deepened under a cyber and technology pillar of the bilateral relationship, including on digitization and the digital economy. Tech is a priority sector under the update to Australia's India economic strategy. The Australian government will work with Australian tech firms to capitalize on India's emergence as a global technology powerhouse and a source of trusted technical talent. Australian software company Atlassian is a great example of Australia and Indian tech collaboration. Atlassian has opened a world-class research and development center here in Bengaluru. Starting with just over 60 employees in 2018, it now has more than 1,400 employees at its R&D center here, with aggressive plans to hire more by the end of this FY. Next FY, I should say. This year also saw Atlassian place in the top 20 best workplaces in India. Its CEO, Mike Cannon Brooks, is one of our Australia India business champions, and it was my pleasure to meet with him recently during his visit to India in September. Another good example, of course, is TCS, which has a significant client base in Australia. The company has recruited more than 100 graduates this year and hosted 50 new Colombo plan students to date. The signing of the Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement and our India Economic Strategy Update are milestone achievements. More and more Australian companies are doing business with and in India and vice versa. We will open a new Consulate General in Bengaluru next year, as well as a Centre of Excellence on Critical and Emerging Technology Policy. There remains an ocean of opportunity to be explored and developed particularly in the tech sector. But of course, governments can only do so much to pave the way for greater B2B engagement. Business itself will take the wheel to find and develop new opportunities. Deepened B2B engagement will help us navigate from great potential through to delivery. That's why I'm so pleased to be here with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hugh, for those excellent remarks on how India and Australia are so well uh, poised to dramatically expand technology and innovation cooperation by aligning Australia's sectoral strengths with India's transformational journey. Um, I'd now like to invite on stage our panelists uh, for this session, Mr. Gavin Standen, Executive Partner, Ecosystem Telstra. Ms. Annette De Silva, Head for South Asia Technology and Emerging Sectors, Trade and Investment, Queensland. Mr. S. V. Venkatraman, Managing Director, ANZ Support Services, India, Private Limited. Ms. Nandani uh, Sabanayagam, uh, Managing Director, ANSR. Mr. Yatish Venkatesh, Australian alumnus and founder of Purple Rock Entertainers. Welcome and wonderful to have all of you with us. Thanks everyone who's just joined us uh, in the last few minutes. It's wonderful to see uh, an almost full house on the last day 
of, uh, of this summit, uh, which is quite rare uh, for a third day. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'll start off my first question to Gavin. Um, so Gavin Telstra has had groundbreaking results by successfully leveraging global collaboration and the partner ecosystem to offer sustainable and innovation, uh, innovative solutions. As an Australian company who's been a large investor here in India for the last three years, what opportunities do you see for Indian companies who are looking to collaborate with firms such as yours? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Petula. Very good question. Um, let me place it on record. Telstra has been a very serious investor in India. We've been in India, or rather invested in India for the past 30 years. Um, and I don't know how many of you all know, the first cell phone call in India was made on a Telstra Modi network in 1994. So we have been there from the inception of mobility in India. So a couple of good points to really share with some of the industries that want to collaborate both between Australia and with Australian companies in India. One is when you look at India, you think digital. And things are huge, very articul I mean, articulated very well. It's the adoption, it's the digital literacy, and digital at scale. I think that's one thing that really attracts us. The second one, especially specifically Bengaluru, is the diversity that you see in digital talent. It's the economies of scale that we see as we come and collaborate with our partners. And take it from me, it's really the envy of the world because you're spoiled for choice when you come to India. You have the world's best set of global system integrators. You have a very fledging economy. You have the world's largest youth population. And last but not the least, the access to technology, the access to government, the access to academia is unmatched. And so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two. When you look at collaborating with Australian companies, take it from me, the amount of opportunities you have is humongous. Just to look at the bilateral trade between Australia and India, it's about $27 billion as of last year. And growing, growing at about 14% compounded annual growth rate. Very, very enviable. The opportunity that you see there is just not the economics. The opportunity that you see is there is the innovation, the transformation, the ease of doing business, and most importantly, our risk appetite to try something new. So my call to action for any business, especially Indian businesses who want to do business with Australian companies are, if you have that strength on innovation, transformation, thinking out of the box, and the risk appetite to try something new, and we technically are a mobility and a technology company that always has to be on, so always on is always our center of what we do for our customers, our employees, and our stakeholders. So that would be what I would say, you know, lessons that Indian companies can take from us. Great, thanks, Gavin. And, um, you know, I think you made that sound really attractive uh, for any Indian company looking at collaborating uh, with companies like yours. Um, and we'll, of course, come back to you again. Uh, I want to move to Annette. Um, so, uh, from a Victorian company to the Australian government, uh, you know, to hear from you. So, we've been seeing that currently it's great with global trade, but also bilateral trade with India and Australia growing. We've seen uh, tourism, um, tourist arrivals in Australia, all of these crossing, um, you know, pre-pandemic levels already. We're also seeing... Um, to way trade de delegations picking up business delegations, including to and from Queensland. So my question is, you know, post pandemic, which are the sectors or the trends where you see the most promise uh, for collaboration with India and Queensland? Sure, thanks for that question, Petula. And uh, 
you know, I agree with you in many aspects. I think uh, I've never seen, uh, you know, an Australia-India relationship growing so much uh, since, I mean, post-pandemic to be more specific. Uh, as you'd mentioned that uh, we've seen, uh, you know, the Australia Consulate that would be uh, in Bangalore very soon, the Center of Innovation, and the Australia government's update to the uh, India Economic Strategy, and of course, the Australia-India ECTA agreement. I think to, and in fact, my colleagues here also kind of agree that we are associated with Australia at probably the right time. But coming to your question on uh, what are the priority sectors that Queensland is focusing on, is uh, as most of you are aware that India contributes largely to vaccine and drug development to the world. And I think one thing that we could synergize with India really well uh, with Australia for that matter, is to collaborate on clinical trial collaborations. I think uh, what uh, Australia really has is the best of best resources. We have the talent available there, we have good institutes. So working on clinical trial collaborations is something that uh, we could always focus on. And of course the second uh, sector would be green hydrogen and clean energy. Uh, you know, after the announcement of the Green Hydrogen Policy 2021, uh, a lot of companies in India are looking to go zero emission. So, uh, collaborating on the green hydrogen, because Australia has abundant of space, we have, uh, you know, solar farms, we have wind farms, we have so much going on over there. So, if we could synergize on that aspect, that's uh, something that we could work on. Uh, the third uh, sector is definitely digital and innovation. Uh, I think uh, India, like uh, you know, Gavin mentioned, we have so much of talent available here. How to integrate, uh, you know, through our talent on the digital and innovation space is something that we can really work on. Uh, for example, Brisbane is going to host the Olympics uh, in 2032. Now, how to integrate yourself on the long run? I know it's 10 years from now but uh, there's a lot of opportunities that we can work on. And I'd like to quote an example of a company, Tata Communications, that recently expanded their operations in Brisbane. And they've, they've understood the longer term that, you know, uh, Queensland specifically is a decentralized state. There are a lot of opportunities in the tier two cities. So you can integrate to the tier two cities and also look long term, long term strategy, all rolling up to the Brisbane Olympics and much more. Thanks, that, that great and, and covered, I think, many of the uh, emerging technology and the emerging opportunities uh, that are <clears throat> available for companies to collaborate on. I'm going to uh, move uh, this side to my right to uh, Venkat Raman from ANZ. Um, so just last week, ANZ globally reported a $2.3 million profit going up 20% from last year. Congratulations to all of you. Um, and ANZ has been here, the banking uh, and the, the, the commercial uh, banking um, division since 1984. Um, and I think while many of the foreign banks are now looking to, to restructure, to build on their strengths, uh, to diversify, ANZ has been here for a long time and has been doing it very successfully. Um, so, so the question I think to you, uh, and if you could share this with us, what, do you, what is um, you know, your views on the health of the banking industry in India? And, you know, building on that, where are the areas for collaboration between India and Australia? Sure. And thank An you honest for, perspective. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for having me in this panel. So, it's a, it's a great question. Um, just a slight correction. The bank that ANZ acquired in 1984 has been in India for 170 years. This used to be called Grindley's and ANZ acquired that. So, secondly, what people may not know is ANZ was one of the earliest adopters of the Indian tech space when we opened our uh, uh, tech uh, shop here in 1989. So, one of the earliest banks to do that and definitely the number one earliest Australian company to do that and come to India. And that has since then grown spectacularly for us. So, you asked a question about the Indian banking sector. The Indian banking sector um, had a rough ride in the, in the, in the last decade. But 
the way it dealt with with the pandemic and came out of it has been quite credible so if you just look at some of the numbers um, the npa uh, numbers that rbi publishes uh, are looking much better than what was expected they were they were looking at a 10% non performing asset number but it's likely to close at under 6 so that's a good thing most of the indian public sector banks are doing quite well uh, in terms of uh, the profitability a lot of them are coming back to profitability and credit growth has been very robust so the banking sector in india is alive and well and doing doing excellent work as far as uh, uh, anz's involvement in india is uh, goes so we had a bank as i said for many years and then we came back to establish an institutional bank in india in in 2009 10 um, and that's uh, uh, that's that's come out quite well and our strategy is actually ans's stated strategy is leveraging the trade and capital flows from australia to asia and australia to uh, uh, asia to new zealand so for us the trade agreement that has come through is a very very big uh, plus and while uh, you know you mentioned in your uh, early address that it is moved from mutual intent to robust action what we would as a bank like is sustained sort of robust action because the more australian uh, uh, companies come in and the 27 billion that gavin spoke about rises it directly impacts all the banks that are operating in india not only the indian banks but us cba nap you know all of them who have got presence here so uh, the, the the trade agreement are very key for our strategy and we are watching that very closely and you some of the comments that you made about welcoming australian companies in india and welcoming indian companies there those are really really uh, fascinating things for us because that will is what will drive the bank's performance in india okay great great response thank you anki we'll come back to you um nandini um so india currently has uh, about 1500 plus uh, global capability centers that's only grow, growing uh, i've heard there's 300 to 500 expected to be added again uh, next year is generating about 1 million jobs uh, and 28.3 billion dollars in terms of revenue um ansr has been uh, you know a major player in this space um, what do you see as um, you know the opportunities as well as how do you see this transforming um, in over the next couple of years what What should Indian and Australian businesses be aware of? Uh. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I do realize I'm probably the one non-Australian company being represented here on the panel. So thank you for having me here. Um, so you were talking about GCCs, which is the Global Capability Centers. Hugh in his uh, note talked about uh, the Indo-Australian collaboration. Uh, leveraging technology capabilities out of india and that's what most global organizations are doing uh, there are 1500 gccs um today um with significantly mature operating models they are the capability centers are no longer acting as like doers for their headquarters many of them have matured to become uh, the second headquarters uh several senior leadership roles corporate uh, global leadership roles are now being done uh, or are being held in the uh, gccs themselves any emerging technology that's happening globally anywhere in any corporation will have a footprint um of contribution coming from india um also the um evolution of uh, the infrastructure and the ecosystem has has really helped bring in many many organizations um, uh, wanting to set up their uh, second center in india taking advantage of the um, uh, highly qualified talent pool uh, um, so the ecosystem of you know uh, real estates in terms of technology parks the telecom infrastructure that is very mature and reliable um, also the talent pool and not to forget uh, the startup culture right the uh, india has got one of the uh, fastest growing startup ecosystems in the world um, and uh, the gccs are collaborating the 1500 gccs are collaborating roughly with 
300 plus startups every year. So literally in the backyard, you are, you have this whole, um, you know, uh, whole ecosystem of innovation and very creative problem solving that you can access uh, right in your backyard, which would be very difficult for many countries to boast about. So uh, you have the talent pool, you have the culture of innovation, you have access to startups, uh, the infrastructure is great. So this is going to continue to emerge and evolve. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the GCC will no longer be called GCC in a few years from now. They will be the second headquarters. They are just like an extension of a building down the street from wherever the headquarters is, is hosted. Um, and um, th this, there is more to look forward to in terms of investments coming in from multiple countries. Pandemic has shown that uh, work can happen from anywhere. And so the collaboration technologies have really taken off and that's made uh, working from anywhere, uh, you know, uh, very real and very possible and also supported by many government policies. Um, you know, the recent SEC work from home policies are allow are allowing hybrid working to really thrive now under a regulated structure. Uh, I, th I think this is just going to bring more and more people uh, that had kind of dropped off or stepped off of the workforce. You talked about women having stepped off the workforce during the pandemic. This is b helping bring uh, many of them back into the workforce in full strength. So I think really looking forward to the next evolution of the capability centers um, in India and elsewhere. Great, thanks, thanks so much and plenty of opportunity, as you've said, to collaborate. I'm not going to move on to, uh, to an interesting sector, um, entertainment, uh, the in entertainment industry and the creative industry sector. And for that, um, Yatish, um, you know, so the, there's a quote from the famous actor uh, Michael Keating, um, um, you know, the DC films, who says filmmaking is the ultimate team sport. Uh, right, so, so I think my question to you, given your experience in movie production in the OTT platforms, where do you see the opportunities for India and Australia to team up um, in, in creative industry space and also the entertainment technology industry? Um, Hello everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, the question, uh, Petula asked was, see, uh, entertainment industry is very vast in that uh, movie production is one part and uh, in that uh, you have pre-production and the post-production involved in it. So pre-production, it will be uh, involved with more of uh, collaboration with my uh, creative directors and uh, between other uh, creative people along with that. So that in that uh, uh, we could uh, see much of collaboration happening inside the uh, 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 production side. But when it comes to a production like the shoot wise, when you go for a shoot, there are a lot of opportunities we can explore from the tourism side to promote the tourism as well as the uh, uh, em employment wise uh, giving more employment to the both the uh, uh, citizens uh, from both the uh, places and also we have a lot of other collaborations which is needed after the production that's the uh, post production side where a lot of vfx sound and other uh, um, equipments and all other uh, technology side is involved in it and a lot of technology is coming up to the entertainment side which was not there before and uh, before the uh, pandemic it was like a normal uh, sector which was running through but uh, we uh, got to know more of uh, from the post production side uh, we established a lot of uh, uh, employment thing from India to Australia Particularly, I think we worked in Sydney and Melbourne. We used to give VFX uh, works from India so that uh, 
uh, not only seeing the digital part, but but the VFX and the other uh, cameras, everything were all uh, mostly uh, updated there. And uh, we used to take all these um, uh, uh, different uh, technologies brought to the movies, and that helped us a lot and made it even easier for us in the pandemic to uh, take our movie uh, production on an ease basis. And uh, one more thing was uh, my, uh, my uh, own production, which I started as an OT, uh, from the OTT. I released that movie in the year 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2019. So that was my uh, first OTT release as in to a OTT platform that went to 195 countries. As in, uh, I had a streaming uh, of around uh, uh, 17 lakh people, like uh, 0.7 million people watching for just eight days. So that was the reach what we used to get when it was digitalized. So this was our uh, first achievement, what we did, collaborating with the um, Australian side as well as many other countries as well. And um, uh, not to uh, forget that, my, that particular movie, I had the uh, DOP from America and the uh, uh, music from uh, LA, that's in America as well. So we op uh, had works distributed to each and every uh, country and particularly in Australia, we had the post-production which is very strong there. So we made it utilized there. So that is one uh, collaboration we could, uh, I mean, there are a lot of other opportunities which are uh, we are exploring right now. and. Uh, um, I usually visit the uh, Cannes Film Festival and the MIPCOM event which happens every year. Uh, so this year I was there. Um, I could meet my other uh, Australian um, artists and technicians and all. I used to meet them and they are very much interested to come uh, shoot in India as well because they have, we have a lot, uh, uh, lot of very good uh, locations and all those things. So improving that tourism also will improve on that and uh, providing more uh, uh, opportunity and uh, 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 people we can give a lot of jobs here also on that basis, I think. So that's the teamwork is involved. That is what uh, Mr. Michael Keaton has told. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I think not just you know contributing to the economy, but but also it helps to build those cultural bridges between uh, the two countries. You're also an Australian alumnus, so so we'll be looking to you towards uh, helping us progress those uh, collaborations. Or um, we, I'm just going to take some questions from the audience, if that's all right. Uh, and if anything isn't covered, I'll maybe go back to some of the other questions. Um, if, yes, if we could just have the, uh, um, microphone, okay, well, sorry, we'll come back to you, yeah. Uh, Mr. Yatish, I Kranthi, have a... yeah, that's you. Yes, Hi. please. Another Australian alumnus. Hi. Hi. Uh, Yatish, this is a qu question uh, directed towards you. Filmmaking generally is, I mean, it involves, you know, big budgets. Naturally, in India, the budgets that we actually have, in comparison to, uh, I guess, you know, the American market or the Australian market is much lower. So how, in the, how do we actually bridge the gap between both these countries in terms of trying to get people involved and also, you know, because I'm also looking at from the point of view of a smaller, you know, producer. Um, $1 million for a small producer is big amounts in compared to, you know, when you compare it to studios. Studios have budgets of 10 million, 100 million and, you know, a billion too. But smaller producers in India have budgets only of up to a million or up to 2 million. So, how do we actually get these people to collaborate, you know, what is this with uh, the Australian counterparts? Karati, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, see, uh, there are a lot of uh, other uh, movie-related festivals happens here from the government of Karnataka and a lot of uh, other counterparts. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, uh, movie-related uh, uh, sessions happens here. So I could say like 
uh, we, we need to invite a lot of other uh, uh, Australian interests and as well as collaborating with the Indian interests, uh, getting both them together. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, government uh, uh, organizations which work closely for the uh, small budget movies as well. Like uh, there are a lot of other uh, short movies, uh, uh, awardees and other uh, festivals happening here. So we would like to get all the uh, uh, other uh, movie makers who want to come to that events and explore more of the opportunities there. And the government is also willing to help in that way. They have some grants given to uh, both the, uh, 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 the uh, creative creators and uh, there, uh, they, uh, there are a lot of opportunities and I am also one of the uh, grantee taken from the government of uh, Karnataka. Had some pitches done from my side and uh, small or big uh, movies doesn't matter in that way. It's just the uh, project or uh, a content which you take, uh, which can be used as in like a small uh, or big, it doesn't matter in that way. So, uh, government of Karnataka and even uh, Australian government uh, can collaborate in that way and uh, bring in more uh, uh, small budget movie makers and all uh, together and that I think that's a good thing which we should have to look at in, uh, in near future and probably we will also work with the government for this uh, to bring them together as well. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the gentleman here, if you can have a... Just have one mic. question. Yeah, right. So I'm an uh, Australian um, alumni. I studied in 1996 in Brisbane. I mean, I'm amazed at the beauty of your city, you know. I, you know, just the roads, the, the way the city is kept so beautifully. So my question to, the, to you is that I'd like to see in this in, Indo-Australian uh, sort of partnership, I'd like to see more and more of the government agency collaborating with each other, especially like our, uh, you know, local bodies like our BBMP that can collaborate with, uh, you know, the, maybe the Brisbane municipality or whatever it's called there just to share expertise with each other on how to keep your city more beautiful, uh, you know, because you guys have, we have lived there, we've seen it. So my thing is beyond, beyond money, if you could look at more collaboration between, let's say the RTO of uh, India with the uh, road transport, or the municipalities that can talk to each other, you know, a bit of expertise exchange and so if, they, if you can throw some light, if any such thing is already happening, uh, we'd like to see more of that, you know. Thank you very much. Um, I agree. I think that is a, a really great site uh, or node for further cooperation. Um, Australia, as many of you would know, like India, uh, we are a federation of states. And the sort of rubber hits the road on issues like, you know, management of cities, municipalities at the state level. States have a lot of power and are empowered to do that. Um, some Australian states have sister state relationships with uh, Indian states uh, as well and city to city too. I think that that is definitely something that perhaps those those relationships could look at engaging more in. Um, I also think to lean on what you said, sir, that the tourism part of that um, should also be considered in terms of how can we then project images of the beautiful cities in India and the beautiful cities in Australia um, to the world, to our sort of mutual benefit through showcasing what we have there. I also think that there's something to be said for deepened collaboration on the infrastructure that supports our cities, particularly Australian investment into Indian infrastructure and vice versa for things like road safety and management of roads. Macquarie does a lot of that here. Um, we're working hard with India to do more of that, including standing up an infrastructure forum, which I hope will lead to greater engagement in that space. Um, but thank you very much, and also for, uh, for letting everybody know how beautiful some of these cities are. Much appreciated. Uh, yes, if we could just have the microphones passed around. Yeah, thank you.
good morning myself uh, sushant shetty my question is directed to the entertainment industry and i'm happy to see from last two days i have somebody today from entertainment industry from last two days i had this question i'm a mechanical engineer by qualification but by passion i'm into content creation as a individual content creator my idea is to collaborate the culture of different parts of the world in india people do it in different ways like for example indians go to different parts of world create content with foreigners my idea is a reversal of that i imagine uh, abroad or foreign within india for me that's goa so where lot of foreigners come and make trips so i create vlogs and content with these people ask them what they love about india exchange culture from go from india to theirs and again exchange language basically i teach them a sentence of kannada hindi and they repeat it and uh, they teach portuguese german uh, australian is almost english so they teach their language and i try, try to repeat that and make a content now my all my production work or what do you say shooting is done but i am now looking for a collaborative effort where somebody could he help me with color grading editing and further help me to publish it further but when it comes to indians it's more like once you become popular everybody will come and 10 people will come and say i'll invest i'll invest i'll invest and it's like we should choose among the 10 but when we are budding and we have content people won't recognize it so i need uh, some australian uh, companies or anybody from here to give support to this and uh, also let me know how we can collaborate thank you so uh, for that question uh, there are lot of uh, australian people who are collaborated with the indian uh, 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 studios as well so it doesn't matter that australian thing i mean uh, the uh, studio side is not there it is already there and they are already working as i said earlier the vfx part is already uh, uh, done in australia also a uh, lot of indian movies are also done there and we ourselves have uh, work with them so in that way i think with the post production side as of the color grading and all that also has to be done in india as well and uh, the australian people are not uh, i mean australian uh, people are working already with them so uh, i can put you with many of the people uh, i can refer it to you and there are small uh, small aspects or big but you can work here also with the uh, people so that is there i can help you with that thanks we'll just take maybe two questions uh, so if you could ask your questions together and we'll we'll get one of the panel to answer it yeah uh, yeah uh, hello can you hear me okay uh, so ma'am my question is directed towards you right uh, so i come from the northern part of india called punjab Uh, half of my relatives like most of the punjabis are settled uh, who those are settled abroad are settled in australia uh, we have seen the uh, brain drain sort of uh, where it started in 1990s uh, towards the australian side but not so much from the australian government towards the indian side right uh, so my question to you is uh, how is australian government thinking of collaborating with indian mind uh, particularly in the tech sector because bangalore is known for that i'm a tech founder myself uh, how is the australian government or the australian indo australian chamber of commerce thinking of collaborating with indian tech startups or indian tech ecosystem kevin would you like to speak a little about startups and the sure um so sorry i had a hard time really yes, trying to figure out the question if i understand it right is what are the platforms and opportunities we have for indian startups would that be the rough summary of the question excellent uh, see um i'll talk about telstra and i presume a lot of my panelists will support me in this approach what we do is we look at startups that are relevant that's condition number 1 but what we have deliberately started to do is we associate ourselves with a lot of global service integrators right like tcs web pros infosys of the world we also try to encourage a champion and the champion is what nandini just spoke about which is the global capability center which is telstra india but there is one position that we 
intentionally encourage, which is a disruptor. And if you are a startup and you are ready to come and disrupt my status quo today, the way I serve my customers, the way I roll out 5G, the way I drive last mile connectivity. Like for example, a lot of companies will connect metros. A lot of companies will connect port cities. A lot of companies will not be connecting you on the last mile. And that is where we see a lot of opportunity for startups. So in the disruptor role, I can tell you, I mean, so we have a lot of incubators, we have a lot of hackathons, where we actually encourage universities, we encourage startups to come and challenge some of the business problems we have and see if we can solution them. So there's a very curated model how we incubate them, how we fund them, how we invest in them. So there is a, there is a science behind it. Can I tell you it's very matured? Not really, but it is evolving. That would be my take. Thanks. Okay, uh, sorry, we'll just take... Uh, do you want to add something to that? Uh, one uh, important aspect to this, one of the things that startups value is having a good business problem to solve. And I think that's where we, all of us on the panel can help because you have the ideas, but you need a big business problem to solve. And you mentioned about connectivity in smaller towns. For us, you know, if there is a method to, to do KYC better or if there is a, a, a solution to, let's say, handling documents better, I think that business problem is where we can help uh, startups and I'm sure we are all uh, involved and we want to be helpful in that respect. Thanks, Venki. Um, you know, we are, the panel is going to stay on, uh, you know, after this where we can connect and I'm told there isn't a session here at the moment. Um, so I think what I'll just do, if I could have, you know, a few seconds of each of you with any last comments that you'd like to make on this, if uh, I think for those who didn't have the opportunity to be answered, a, to be asked a question, Anit. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, no, so I just want to emphasize on, uh, uh, you know, what the Queensland government is planning to do uh, over the coming years and, uh, uh, you know, a lot, you, 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 uh, you know, you wanted a, qu a question about, uh, the, you know, tech startups and what do they have uh, in store. I think we have the center of innovation that would also come up soon in Bangalore. I think uh, integrating into the system, uh, you know, the Australia uh, government system and also bringing uh, bring solutions to the uh, whole ecosystem in Australia uh, is something that we are focusing on. But from Queensland government, I think uh, we continue to focus on minds and we have the IMME show that uh, my colleague Parthiban is going to head in Kolkata. So anyone who's interested in the mining segment there could, uh, you know, uh, meet him, have the show there. Uh, but the other uh, segment that I think uh, that we are also focusing on is the Australia-India, uh, you know, ECTA agreement uh, that was just signed off. Uh, you know, in the long term, if you look, there's a long-term strategy which is going to be rolled out for three, five, seven years. So if you're looking at long term, I think one of the key focus sectors that both Australia and India can work on is the agricultural sector. So that's something that we could work on together. The, I mean, the business is always there. Uh, it's always been going to and fro. Uh, I mean, if you see the agreement, it has lentils, and lentils is a staple food for India. That's something that we can always work on. And the long run, we are having avocados, and we have sheep meat, a couple of things that can bring a lot of value add to both the countries. So the momentum is there, but it's only gotten better. And I think all our team members here, and including me, would be happy to answer any queries that you have in terms of exports from Queensland to India. And if you're looking at investing in Queensland or you're looking to bring your startups to Queensland, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. Uh, Nandini, would you like to, uh, any last comments? Yeah, so, um, Quickly coming back to the capability centers, uh, collaboration between the two con uh, con countries continue. Um, answer ourselves, we have been part of setting up several Australian uh, companies' capability center in India. Um, and uh, as we look forward to signing up our 100th uh, capability center in the next few months, I know that with the demand for tech talent globally, uh, the next 100 will happen in the next 3-4 years. What took us 15 years, I think we are in such an accelerated growth mode in the tech space that it will happen within the next 10-15 to 15 years.
Great. Wenki, any comments from you? Uh, uh, just a couple of closing comments on what this trade agreement means for us. Obviously, it's very big from a banking point of view. It makes a lot of sense for us to be involved there. Um, there is a lot of progress in a few areas where I think the countries can work very closely. Talent mobility is a very big one. There are still some niggling issues around tax. But if we can get all those settled, I think the, the cross-border flows, trade flows will just, just boom. And we may, we may well be, you know, if I think Australia and India are the fifth largest trade partner uh, for us. So moving that up to uh, second or third should not be a big, very big problem the next uh, decade or so. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, Captain? Yeah, um, I think so the panelists have covered a plethora of things, but there are a few things that I would like to say. It's very difficult for us to admire Bangalore and India, Bengaluru and India staying here. It's only when you go across, you really admire the potential you have here. Yes, you will have some of those infrastructure challenges. There's constant improvement that has to be invested. But let me tell you one thing. Do not forget the potential that we have in Bangalore and in India. The digital skills are unmatched. The startup ecosystem is extremely vibrant. The potential to invest both ways is significantly improving and getting very, very attractive. I think so, we have leaned a lot towards the West. Now it's time for us to shift to the East. I think so that, that would be my, you know, my parting comments. Thanks, Cap. Yatish, uh, anything from you? Uh, yeah. Uh, you got the majority of the questions. <laughs> uh, always, uh, entertainment industry has been an attractive industry, first thing. <laughs> So, we get a lot of questions shooting first. So, uh, I would like to say uh, 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 um, only thing is the entertainment is growing faster and faster. No, no doubt, uh, whatever if it's COVID or no COVID, even in the COVID side, it was more uh, when compared to the regular uh, uh, now uh, businesses. So, I would like to say everyone that uh, even Australia and India has to collaborate more on the technical side and uh, a lot of government uh, aided funds has already been uh, allocated for these AVGC sectors and uh, there is a center of excellence already existing in Bangalore which a lot of Indian movies have already taken part in the body scan, uh, mocap, everything is facilitated here and a lot of our people are not known much but that we are trying to establish that and um, definitely tell our people to make use of these facilities here. And as well, I welcome our uh, Australian counterparts also to visit here and uh, uh, hoping to work in a better uh, way and uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Yathish. I'm going to let you. you have the last word. Uh, any final comments? Thank you. I rarely get the last word on anything. Um, I think it would be uh, remiss not to mention what I think is going to be the sector that's going to play you know, a really major role in the future of our economic relationship, which uh, you've mentioned earlier, which is renewable energy. Um, this is something that, as Australia and India, both we both face similar challenges on climate, along with most people in our region and indeed the world. Um, we're committed to, to transitioning to clean energy um, we're committed to working together to do that. And I think one of the, one of the earliest and perhaps you know, most exciting ways in which we're doing that is going to be collaboration between Australia and India on critical minerals and particularly battery minerals like lithium and cobalt that can then go into electric vehicles to fuel Prime Minister Modi's ambitious plans for EVs here in India. That's just one example of how um, Australia is looking to plug itself into the Indian growth story whilst at the same time hopefully contributing to, to the battle against climate change. So I think that is going to be a really big part of this relationship going forward. Um, we're working hard with India on it. India's G20 presidency is going to focus on some of these issues. So I'm looking forward to seeing the profile of that presidency translate into further action and action taken with Australia. Thank you so much again for having me. Thanks so much, Hugh, and I, I think it is a future-focused and outcome-focused partnership that you'll, that you'll see more of. 
thank you so much for being an amazing audience and a brilliant uh, panel that we had here. So thank you for all your insights. Uh, I'd also like to quickly thank the Australian government for being country partner and for giving us the opportunity to curate this session. Thank you to our members. Thank you to those who are non-members, and we hope you join us. Thank you to the Australian alumni who are here in large numbers. And uh, I must mention Aditya from our team, a manager membership who's done a great job in, um, you know, uh, putting much of this together, and Ruben as well from our team. Thank you very much for being here. We'd just like to take a group photo and uh, present some mementos to the panel before we wind up. <laughs>